What is up guys, this is Pete aka Characters and welcome back to the most irregular and most inspiring podcast on the interwebs about the game of No Limit Hold'em. This is the Carrot Poker Podcast and we are back finally um, a few weeks later for the next episode. It's going to be every week this time, I promise it really is from this point on. I've actually already lined up a bunch of students to come on the show and do my 100 Hands book promotion podcasts that are about to happen. You've seen one of them already, but I'm about to do way more podcasts of the format where the student gives me a number between 1 and 100 and I analyse the corresponding hand and that happens two or three times throughout the course of the podcast and the student has gets put in the spot and gets told to you know give me their best guess, write down some questions for the hands that they've picked. So yeah, I guess the chronological order there is not too accurate. I give the student the numbers first and they prepare a little bit about the hands. Don't want to just like make them have to flounder like on live um, podcast um, YouTube-ness. I can't say live TV. I don't know what I call it. But yeah, don't want to have to like put them on the spot. So I, the, the format is I like, give them a couple of numbers. They prepare some, some thoughts and questions on the corresponding hands. And then I see how their answers and questions relate to the material in the book. I quote you some delicious sentences paragraphs from the book to hopefully whet your appetite for what's to follow when it's released and we go over some hands so that's cool I'm going to be doing a lot more of that in the next few weeks today I just really wanted to check in with you guys I wanted to make a short podcast just to say thank you so much for your support like a bunch of you have emailed me and said you know we think the podcast is great we love it blah 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 when is your book out and I just feel really bad because I've not been giving you guys the content that you deserve as subscribers on YouTube iTunes Wherever you're following along, please, if you're watching this on YouTube, subscribe. I promise you, you will be rewarded for it. You will not be disappointed if you hit that subscribe button. I will be back with more podcasts in the next few weeks um, because I am a poker writer. And when you're a poker writer, normally poker writers are a bit better at publicizing themselves than I am, which is why I really appreciate the emails that I get because it inspires me to get out there more, make more podcasts and get more promotion, basically, which is what I'm going to be focusing on in the next few weeks after the book launch. So more about the book then. It's coming out, 100 Hands, the book where I go over 100 hands in detail, 50 played by me, 50 played by my students, and write 100 essays about those hands, is due for release in a few weeks' time. I am almost at the end of writing all the hand reviews, and I'm actually, I've done 90 of them. I'm going to be doing the last 10 in the next week. Then in the next two weeks, I'm going to be tidying up some editing, final touches, and getting the thing out there. The editing has mostly been, I've been doing it as I go kind of thing, and I have a couple of people helping with that, me with that, which is cool. Um, and the book is going to be out as soon as all that is done. It'll be on my website, carrotcorner.com, where you can buy it. There'll be probably some kind of discount where you can get that and the Grinders Manual in a bundle if you've not already read the Grinders Manual. Shame on you. Um, so yeah, what I'm going to do today is just talk a little bit more about what it's like to be writing this book what the book is, the kind of form that the book has taken, because when you start writing something, or at least when I do, I don't always have a clear impression of what I'm going to do. I've got a rough idea, I know. I'm going to write 100 essays on 100 hands. I'm going to go into loads of detail, and I'm going to just solve lots and lots of spots repeatedly until the, the reader gets a really good sense for how I think about the game, right? That was the original premise, and that is largely what's happened, thankfully. I stuck to that, you know, pretty closely this time. Um... What I learned about, I guess, the, the the form that the book started to take of its own accord was that the difficulty. I hadn't quite planned exactly what the difficulty level of the book was going to be. So I'm going to start there and let you guys in on that. This book is a step up from the Grinders Manual. The Grinders Manual is geared for complete beginners to six max that have got some rough idea of like the rules of the game and some very, very, very basic notion of how strategy might be, um, how you might think about poker strategy. Um, an absolute beginner will find themselves out of their depth quite quickly in the Grinders Manual if they go too quickly. Um, the same is very much true here for 100 hands. The level starts off at around the mid to upper stages of the Grinders Manual and within a few hands we're actually kind of flying above where the Grinders Manual left off. So this book is not really for someone who hasn't read the Grinders Manual or hasn't got a decent grasp of the game. I think it will still help you, but I would recommend the Grinders Manual first and then 100 Hands. I take a few things for granted in 100 Hands. I take more and more for granted as the book progresses. 
it's not wise to read this book by just starting at hand 88 and then like randomly number generating what hands you're going to read if you like that kind of randomization it's not going to work well for 100 hands because in this book I start off a fairly yeah, like I say, just around the middle to the top of Grinder's Manual and I explain everything. It's not even that the material is as easy as Grinder's Manual, it's more that the earlier hands have a higher degree of explanation, less abbreviations, that kind of thing. They spell it out for the student as if the student has maybe read Grinder's Manual but is a little bit rusty on some of the concepts and sort of takes it from there. The later hands spruff on about concepts as if the reader has been reading 100 hands chronologically. So although every hand is independent of the preceding and following hands, that doesn't mean that it's okay to just read this book in some random order. You definitely want to read it from cover to cover. Um, that said, the hands are completely random in the sense that there are no themes. There are no like patterns that these hands are on three betting. This hand is like the last one. It differs in X, Y, and Z ways. There's only a couple of points in the book where a hand follows a previous one because it's thematic. Most of the time it's random. Why have I done that? The reasons for the kind of lack of organisation in 100 Hands is that this is a book where I want to put the reader into the driver's seat. I want to make them feel as though they're playing a session just slowed down into mega slow motion where they have so much time. Like imagine you're in a poker session and you suddenly found yourself with like hundreds more time bank than what you actually had and the outside world had like frozen and you were able to just sit and completely solve this spot using whatever tools and thought processes you wanted. That's kind of what this is. That said, I don't go into like absolute combo for combo, range for range detail on absolutely every hand because the idea of 100 hands is, although it's thorough, although the analyses are kind of essays and like very long in some cases, like I mean like a couple of thousand words or whatever, um, I want it to be relatable to an in-game thought process. That's to say, I want the reader, you, to be able to sit down and treat this hand like it was just dealt to you and get analysis from me that not just helps you see how I think and goes into extreme detail, but also is applicable in-game. That's why I'll sometimes categorise things, I'll lump hands into bundles. I'll deviate between giving really full combo-by-combo -combo explanations in some hands so you can see how the actual how the working is in the highest detail and I'll move between that and actually doing an analysis that is more kind of condensed, applicable and usable in a real life poker context. So that's the idea. Um, what other things can I say about the way this book is going to be? Um, I expand on the theory of the Grinders Manual in this book. So that's to say that I actually go above and beyond some of the concepts I actually introduced in the Grinders Manual. This is not as it was originally going to be the Grinders workbook. Originally someone said to me, why don't you make characters like a workbook of the Grinders manual where we can just go through and do hands from that? And I thought about doing that, but I thought, you know what, I did so many example hands in the Grinders manual, like 150 something. More hands than I did in this book, though it's fair to say that because the Grinders manual was more theory, figure heavy, hand chart heavy, and more visual, it was like a textbook, I didn't go into as much detail on the exact hand examples as I have in 100 Hands. So 100 Hands has a higher level of detail than Grinders Manual did about the hands that came that come up, but it doesn't have the same kind of, you know, like supplementary theory stuff because that's already mostly been done in Grinders Manual. So the point is that this difficulty level it does go beyond some of the stuff explained in the Grinders Manual. It's more modern. There are some concepts in 100 Hands that are more to do with the meta game these days at the higher stakes of, or the more competent, I should say, mid stakes, high stakes, and to some extent, small stakes and tough zoom pools like 50, 100 on international stars and things like that. Um, the concepts are very much like adapted so that they're more relevant in this meta. Like, for example, right now, um, people are working more with Pio, and so I'm using Pio recommended and justified strategies in a lot of spots where I want to be balanced. But I'm not just saying Pio does this, copy Pio, as some people who go who will go and mention might actually do. Some coaches just say, well, Pio designs this strategy, you will play it blindly and copy this engine that is playing against itself in the most balanced, optimal way possible. That is far from the highest EV way possible against a lot of your opponents, populations, player types that you will encounter and just with a lot of the reads that you will have on those different categories and specificities of villain. So the point here is very much that 
this book is really looking to keep up with the times. It's an update on the Grinders Manual. It's not invalidating loads of stuff from the Grinders Manual, but I will say that there are a couple of sections of Grinders Manual that are no longer completely correct the way the metagame is today. The metagame obviously meaning the kind of the patterns of what people are doing in relation to what people are doing, etc, etc, basically, right? So what 100 Hands does is it seeks to modernise a lot of the work in the Grinders Manual. For example, real quick, like on C betting, people are now betting a lot smaller with a lot of a, with much more of a high frequency than they were back in the day. And they were polarizing a lot more when the Grinders Manual was written and betting more merged and valuing protection to a higher extent today, right? That's just one of the many thousands of changes that have happened. Micro changes, some of them, some of them major changes that have occurred in the meta and modern understanding of the game due to things like Pio Solver and other kind of solvers and stuff like that, computer engines, blah, blah, blah. And 100 Hands is updating you on what those are, telling you how to optimize now that the population is shifting to something closer to GTO. And what does that mean for us? What thought processes in the Grinders Manual were more based on the meta of 2015, 2016, where people were more polarized than they are today? What does all this merging mean for us? What does it mean that people are three betting semi-linear and linear more than the three betting polar? What does it mean now people are flatting more four bets for a four bet range selection? All these things are covered time and time again and subtly and, you know, obviously different spots throughout the book. And it's very much my aim to update the reader again, I'll just stress this, on those developments and on the current meta, which, by the way, is it's looking like it's going to be somewhere fairly close to the final resting place of the meta of No Limit Hold'em 6 Max. What do I mean by that? I mean that because we are now solving the game, we're getting a lot closer to what GTO solutions actually look like in No Limit Hold'em. Um, we understand that you know you can have various balanced strategies, but one can be higher EV than the other. One can be more optimal. And we're beginning to see what that is by working more with like the engines that we've built to solve EV over many, many different branches where ranges do different things until it finds the most optimal one that's most defensible and retains EV the best. Because we're getting closer to that, I'm not saying that poker's solved or anywhere close. Thank God it's not, because otherwise, you know, I'd be out of a job and this podcast wouldn't be half as interesting if it was just like, welcome back to another episode of Poker is Solved, where today a bunch of regs lost lots of money to the rake and the fish just didn't play the game because it was like chess. Who plays chess against like a world champion for money? No one, unless you're a better world champion. Okay, so, so that's the point. We're keeping up with this meta and we're adjusting the theory as it comes out. What I'm recommending, I believe that most of the strategies I recommend in reg versus reg, let's respect villain, he's probably balanced, let's be balanced as well until we know what's going on, kind of spots, is basically very close to the final resting place of GTO poker. Um, just because GTO poker has a final resting place where we've solved at least how strategy should be, doesn't mean that the game is anywhere near solved because there are always spots we've not looked at, not familiarized ourselves with. We don't recognize how to exploit, you know, all the different imbalances that everyone will always have to a certain extent in all these spots. And the skill of maximizing EV by being exploited, they will always exist, not just against fish, especially against fish, but also against regs who just have little leaks because they're not, they haven't solved every single spot the game has to offer. The game has thousands and thousands of different situations and board runouts and textures. And just because they get closer to optimized than some of the common ones doesn't mean they can even play the next streets to result from that. And that's even at like higher stakes as a lot of regs who just don't know what they're doing, especially in softer pools. So the game is nowhere near solved, but we are moving towards this resting place of GTO theory. Um, if, we, if that's what we're trying to do in some of the common spots, I would say is becoming more familiar to the community what to do at the higher stakes. And that's what this book stresses. It stresses like these are probably optimized strategies are very close to them, but I'm not, I'm not teaching you them in the same way that an engine would recommend. I'm not saying, okay, the optimal strategy here is to bet ace jack 71.3% of the time, ace queen 68% of the time, and ace 10 14% of the time, and have a checking range that's only 4.3% of our range and balance that with blah, blah, blah. I'm not doing that. I'm not actually just plugging in engine lines and then telling you what they are that wouldn't be useful what i'm doing is showing you how to arrive at balanced co-optimal solutions 
using your own ability, using your level of skill, using your understanding of combos and ranges and blockers and what hands block what and what hands are best betting at higher and lower frequencies. Now, that's not got anything to do with exact you know, poker snowy or Pio ranges. But what it does mean is that the concepts that snowy and Pio are kind of using to reach those conclusions are also the same conclusion, also the same concepts that I'm using to teach a simplified, more humanly applicable version of those strategies. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do in 100 hands. It's, it starts off a bit harder than the grounders manual. It modernizes, it does, it deals a lot more with range versus range, with balance, with optimal strategies. It has a lot of exploitative stuff in it as well, though. So if you're a player who loves table selecting, tracking opponents, you know, writing down notes on your opponents, looking to beat them, you know, using the ebb and flow of the kind of the mental battle that goes on there, this book is also for you. This book goes over loads of spots where the GTO solution might be something like X, but actually the in-game what you should do is Y, which is entirely different based on A, B and C reasons for deviating. This happens a lot, but this book is more solid in the long term than the Grinders Manual was, partly because my understanding as a poker professional is now way more solid and the communities is and just poker research, you know, poker, I always think of it like a science. It just evolves at like 50 times the speed of the conventional sciences, although they, those are also accelerating now. Um, and thus we move forward very quickly as a community. And that's why I have had to make these changes to 100 hands. I've had to make sure that it's completely up to date. I see people release poker books that are way behind the times that talk about strategies that were deemed not very good five years ago. I don't want to do that. I don't want to like just pretend to anyone that I know what I'm talking about because I've written a book. I want to write a book that is at the top of the game, just like many decent authors have over the last few years. I want to write a book that's very applicable to the game now in the next few years and it's not a textbook that's an example hand history book that's just like playing a session in slow motion for 100 hands and by the end of it you've studied every hand in such detail and those hands were all hands that you got to play in and had to make tough decisions in that those are the most 100 educational hands of your life and you are a way better player when you step out the other end of them this book is meaty it's massive it's packed full of analysis. Like I say, the analyses are essays. I'm really excited about it. I think it's going to be really cool. I think it's a nice way of doing an exercise book. It's not a stop-start exercise book. So it doesn't say, like some authors, um, and it's a fine format as well, um, actually use this format where they, they start off. I did some work for, for James Sweeney where I did, like, in his book I reviewed, um, he was making videos to go along like a video course to go along with his book and he was employing or he was he was paying like authors and you know poker coaches and things like that well-known ones to kind of write some reviews and um or do video reviews and talk about the hands and the format of of that book was very much like stop start which is fine it's a it's a reasonable format for doing poker exercises like you have this hand what do you do pre-flop well this is what you do pre-flop on the flop, what do you do? Well, this is what you do on the flop. This is not what 100 hands is. 100 hands presents you problems over multiple streets. But here's the thing. The hands played by students are often really badly misplayed. Sometimes they're slightly misplayed. Sometimes they're spot on and the student has nailed it. You don't know which or which. Your job in the green colored hands, which is 50% of the book, or the odd numbered hands in the book, is to go through and actually say, I think the student has done a good job here or a bad job on all of the streets independently, separately, because of what you think of the hand. Then you read me critiquing the student's play, which in turn critiques your analysis of the student's play. It doesn't have to be that you are in the driver's seat all the time. To I got really good at poker when I became a coach. That sounds weird. Like, how did you coach before you were really good? Well, no one was good, but I was at least, you know, working on my game every single day because I was having to articulate stuff to my students. So I think, personally, that the fact that I've got these green hands in there that are not analysis of my play or your play as hero, you're not hero here, the student is hero, but you're imagining through his eyes what you would want to do and what his play is like. It's more objective, it's pretty cool, and it's just a nice way to analyze hands where you are like a third person. People's games grow tremendously when they work in poker communities, forums, Skype groups, sweats, that kind of thing, um, Slack, chat, whatever. 
and they are objective enough. They they are doing an objective task like analyzing their friend's game. They do a better job of that than they do in their own decision making. Why? Because you've got the kind of overseeing kind of objective viewpoint which leads to a higher degree of clarity and skill. And 100 Hands builds your game by making you see things as the impartial observer, not as you're in this spot, what do you do? This guy looks, gives you a funny look, what next? Sure, there's been poker books written where someone gives you a funny look and you need to decide what it means and what to do, right? That's like kind of a joke, but I'm sure that actually has existed um, back in the day when everyone wrote terrible books all the time. Um, but yeah, no, I'm kidding, there are some good books from back in the day, but they're few and far between and they're restricted to the, the knowledge that we knew at the time. So the orangey kind of hands are ones that I've played or hands that I've created and haven't actually played, but they're through my, they're through my viewpoint and they're in a 50nl zoom pool just to strike a kind of average where I think my average reader, not that my average reader will have to play 50nl, but I didn't want to put hands at like 500nl to make people feel alienated, nor did I want to put hands at 5nl to because then the book has less chance of being taken seriously regardless of how good the hand analysis actually is of that stake. I thought 50nl was a nice happy medium treating a player pool that is competent but not great because I think that's what you guys will be dealing with on a regular basis. You will be, if you're listening to this podcast, an aspiring player of some sort. Most likely, you may not be, you may be a hugely successful pro, but the chances are that you're not at this point when you're listening to this kind of podcast instead of just grinding away loads of money. Um, so the reason I've chosen 50NL is that the population reads we can make in that pool are ones that are exploitative. We can exploit the population's tendencies. We can write them what they are. We can say how often they'll apply, like maybe 70% of villains will underbluff this river, therefore the best exploitative strategy is X. We can do all that kind of stuff. So the hands that are through my eyes are actually played, in my opinion, well up until the decision point. So these are hands that are educational up until the point of decision where it ends hero question mark, i.e. what is hero going to do next? So as an example of the one that I've got on the on YouTube there, it's just like a little example of what hand looks like, hand 20. You'll see that if you're on YouTube. If you're just listening, I'll describe it for you, so it's not going to matter. So it's an orange box with hand 20 at the top and then like your classic cards, um, like the same cards I use for the Grinders Manual with the four color deck. And basically you've got like whatever happens in the hand. So under the gun folds, hijack folds, cutoff folds, button raises to $1.50, three big blinds, small blind folds, hero raises to four seventy five, button calls. Hero's got 9-7 of diamonds in the big blind here against this button who's described as a tight looking wreck. Um, and then you've got a decision point on the flop where Hero bets 450 into 965 and button calls. And it's my claim basically that the vast majority of the time these hands are played well when you're seeing my actions. So when you're seeing my raise pre-flop there, when you're seeing my flop bet, these hands are in my opinion played well. They're played fine. Sometimes I will remark on slight mistakes or even considerable mistakes that I've made and I'll say, well, I shouldn't have actually bet the turn because of this. I'm human too. I make mistakes. I admit them. The reason I became better at poker than the average player was because um, I was objective and found all of my mistakes whenever possible and corrected them. Before I did that, I was a huge fish, as I probably told you guys on many podcasts. Not a huge fish. Come on. But I was a reg fish. You know, I was playing badly and unwilling to accept it because I already thought I had everything down. I didn't know what the hell I was doing compared to today's standards. Not even close, not even a thousandth of the understanding I've got today. So you need that attitude of reflectiveness. And there are times on the book where I'll just say, okay, fair enough, I should have opened bigger here. I missed that small blind was a fish or something like that, which probably happened in the hand if it's a real hand. If it's not a real hand, you can, um, you can bet that they're played a little bit better. Anyway, um, on the river there is hero question mark. What do I do now that I've bet twice and been called twice on the flop and turn? Now it's for you to decide what am I going to do? What is a solid player going to do now? What do you think? What would you do? And then I'll tell you in the answer. So the format for the book is, it's not stop start. You read the whole hand, you write down as much as you can, you think about it, you give your, this is how to get the most out of it. Of course you can read it for leisure and you don't have to take notes, but taking notes will help. Um, you form all of your opinions and then you read my essay and see how close you were in various parts. See where you went wrong, how you can improve. You do it again a hundred times, this is going to transform your game. By the time you've done this for the 100th time, if you've done it properly, and then you've reread it and done it again, had part two, where you try to remember how we played the hands and why, 
and then you do it a third time, you can see that you're just going to have such a great familiar familiarity with so many of the spots that have come up. That's what 100 Hands is. It's about teaching in-game, usable, applicable, familiarised competence. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm not trying to teach you a complete comprehensive course in No Limit Hold'em like I was with the Grinders Manual. I'm trying to show you how to apply a comprehensive course in No Limit Hold'em with a few additions, modernizations, and in higher detail to a higher standard of play. That's what I'm trying to do. Hopefully you understand what this book is all about now and I've convinced you that it is going to be a good book for you. I truly believe it is. It'll be out in a few weeks' time. Check it out in my podcast in the next few weeks where I'll have a student on the show giving you loads of examples. You will get tasters. Tune in for that. Subscribe on YouTube. You will see them and listen to the tasters and see what you think. You're in for a treat. I really believe it. I've been kind of so busy with this book that I haven't been able to do as many of the things I've wanted to do. Like like I say, my community has been... I've not been giving as much input to my student forum as normal. I've not been doing podcasts that regularly. I've just been basically writing, 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 and so glad to be at the end now. The light's there at the end of the tunnel, and I've created something I'm really proud of, and I hope that if you enjoyed Grinder's Manual, you will love this book. This book is for you. If you liked Grinder's Manual and you want to move on from that and just read something with a bunch of hand history and analyses, this is for you. This is the Grinder's Workbook, as it was originally going to be called, but it goes above and beyond the Grinders Manual, and that's why it's not called the Grinders Workbook. It is not limited to the stuff in the Grinders Manual. It is like a booster course. It's like the next step up from the Grinders Manual in difficulty. It's a great place to continue having read the Grinders Manual and to make everything in the Grinders Manual more ingrained while also building upon that knowledge. Okay, that's all I want to say for today. I just wanted to let you, you guys know where I was, check in with you all, and I'm super pumped to bring this book out to you and to do a few examples with some of my lovely students getting those guys on the show in the next few weeks and putting them on the spot, seeing what they've got to offer and hopefully correcting them, um, getting insight to my coaching while I'm doing that as well. So if you guys are looking for coaching, I am still taking on students right now. It'll be a bit of a mad rush in the next few weeks. I'll still take you on as soon as the book comes out and maybe even before if I've got, if I can find some availability to get started. But after the book's finished, I'll be taking on students loads again. And I'll be, you know, waiting to hear from you guys. My email address is on screen there. If you're on YouTube, it's admin at carrotcorner.com. My website is carrotcorner.com. And who knows, maybe in three weeks time, you will check in on Carrot Corner and 100 Hands will be there ready to buy it should not be more than about four weeks that is the maximum i expect it to be it might be two weeks it might be three weeks just keep checking in with the podcast and on my website carrotcorner.com there's a page there called 100 hands where i've got progress bars and stuff like that that i finally got rent updating it now reads like 89 hands even though i'm at 90 but whatever next 10 hands next week then editing then publishing and guys keep your emails coming it's been really cool just hearing from you um and for, thank you so much for all the encouragement it means a lot to me because i do just sit at my desk and i work and i work and i get nothing back until the book actually goes out so just to hear that people are awaiting it that makes me feel really good it makes me feel like i'm doing this with a really cool purpose um because i like to know i like to feel as a poker author or whatever that i'm helping people not just that i'm writing about poker and making money i'm also doing this because i want to help people get better and i love hobbies i love games and if i can make people feel better about their hobby and more inspired. That's where the magic is with a hobby like poker or, or chess or any kind of game that you play is feeling that drive and that determination and that inspiration. And that's what I want to do by writing books like this. So happy, sentimental spiel over. Stay tuned next week. There'll be another podcast. Get in touch with me. Let me know what's going on. And I will see you guys very soon. Thank you so much for listening. Take care. Little girl, since you